Welcome to Family Health by Mini First Aid. Mini First Aid are the UK's leading family first aid provider and we are delighted to bring our latest podcast series to you, giving you all the information that you need around family health subjects. Thanks for joining. Series one of Family Health by Mini First Aid podcast is sponsored by Savlon Scar Prevention Gel. Savlon Scar Prevention Gel helps soothe pain, promote faster healing as well as reducing the risk of scarring when used on minor wounds, superficial burns and grazes. With six children in my house, scrapes and cuts are plentiful, so my first aid box saviour is Savlon Scar Prevention Gel. Hello everybody, I'm Kate, founder of Mini First Aid and welcome to our podcast Family Health by Mini First Aid. It is great to hear that you've been enjoying our new family health podcast where we will continue to bring you top family health advice from our leading experts. So I'm delighted to introduce you to our guest today. Dr. Ron Daniels is an NHS consultant in intensive care and is the founder and joint CEO of the UK Sepsis Trust, one that uh, a charity that we are very proud at Mini First Aid to partner with. So welcome to the show, Ron. Thanks for joining us. Hello there, Kate, and thank you so much for having me. Tell me a little bit about yourself then, Ron. Uh, our listeners will want to know, I've obviously told you about the job that you do and the charity that you run, but tell, tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself. Of course. So in, in terms of jobs, yes, I've, I've been a consultant in intensive care in the NHS for about 20 years now, which is quite frightening. Um, and very early on in my career, I watched a young man die of sepsis, and he happened to have a young family, two young children, Tom and Emily. And really, his death is what started me on this journey. I, I just found it unjust. Um, I've got four children myself. I live uh, close to Birmingham in the West Midlands. Two of my kids are older and have left home and two are still at school. So a nice spread. So, you know, I'm, I'm very attuned to the anxieties that parenting brings as well as the needs to safeguard the whole family. We know that the very mention of sepsis can be incredibly scary for families and this fear factor can often lead to a lot of confusion or unknown factors in what information people should listen to. So the aim of today is for us to feel or our listeners to feel really confident in recognising the signs and symptoms of sepsis, potentially know how to treat a suspected case and that crucial thing which is asking the question could it be sepsis. Now, some of our listeners may have watched the ITV documentary recently with Jason Watkins' uh, story on his daughter Maud. Um, and so for some, there's probably a very emotional pull to want to know more about sepsis. So thank you uh, for coming to share that uh, today. Tell us a little bit about this confusion bit. Why do people get confused about sepsis? Well, I think you, you mentioned the key thing here, okay, which, which is the fear factor. And of course, every parent of particularly very young children lives in constant fear of conditions like meningitis. And it's natural, it's human nature. Mm. And I think the first and most important thing to say is that the vast majority of what we call febrile illness or illness with a fever or a temperature in children is nothing to worry about. It's mm. uh, not to be of concern, will go away, and in the vast majority of cases, doesn't even need antibiotics or any medical attention. So that's the first and most important thing. I think the second thing to say is that, yes, sepsis can affect people of all ages. And among children, for example, it's more likely that they'll develop sepsis if they're in the very early days and months of life, particularly okay. if they've got underlying conditions, health conditions. But it can affect children of any age, as you quite rightly pointed out, Jason and Clara's documentary um, showed in a very tragic and moving and emotional way. Infection accounts for between 10 and 15 percent of deaths in children. So it is important that families are aware of what to look out for. The second really important thing. So we've mentioned one important thing is most Infections in children just go away by themselves. They're mostly viral, don't need antibiotics. The second important thing is that the parents trust their instincts. You know your child better than any health professional. And it's really important that you let that health professional know if you're presenting your child to them that you've never seen them this unwell before, obviously, if that's okay. true. And that you're prepared to just ask that question, could it be sepsis? 
So I'm going to ask the most basic of basic questions, but probably one that's on the tip of some people's tongues, which is in really simple terms, what is sepsis? What is it? So it's the way the body responds to an infection. So sepsis is not necessarily a serious infection. It's the body's immune system overreacting to the infection. It's the immune system that starts to cause the damage and starts to damage organs. It can be triggered by any infection. Most commonly, it's things like a chest infection or a water infection. But again, it's the immune system going to overdrive that makes people very sick indeed. Right. OK, so that so with that, then there's I'm just wanting to make sure I'm relaying or any areas of confusion is that sometimes we hear the word septicemia as opposed to sepsis. So is there a difference? Is it the same thing? Is it just a different word? What's the correct language that we should be using? Yeah, so this can be really confusing and, and rest assured to anyone listening. This confuses some health professionals as well. So OK. Not just me. <laughs> no, the simple, the, the most, ba at the most basic level, they're one and the same thing. So blood poisoning, septicemia, sepsis, they all mean the same thing. The reason we sometimes still hear the word septicemia is because in adult medicine, we dropped that term about 20, 30 years ago. And so we just refer to sepsis in adults. But in child medicine, in, pa in paediatric communities, they still use the term septicemia. So it, it keeps getting bandied about. But, but really, we need to focus on just calling this sepsis. It is exactly the same as those other terms. So you talked about sepsis uh, being any, uh, an infection. Uh, can it be anywhere in the body? I and mean, can anything lead to it? It absolutely can. And so sepsis really important that we ha reinforce that this can affect people of any age from okay. um, a very young baby through to a healthy um, youngster through to a middle-aged adult through to an older person um, so the where the infection is that causes sepsis will vary a little between child and adult but broadly the most common cause of infection giving rise to sepsis in both children and adults is a chest infection a pneumonia and, okay. you know, some people will be aware of William Mead's story. That was the case in, in, in William Mead's case and so forth. Pneumonia claims around 10 times as many children's lives as meningitis does. Gosh, that's Thanks to the brilliant success of, you know, uh, the work of charities like Meningitis Now, Meningitis Research Foundation. So meningitis deaths have gone down. Pneumonia is still the biggest killer among children and adults. But yeah, it can be a water infection. It can be something as simple as a cut or a bite or a sting that gets infected. And are there anybody or is there any particular age group that are more vulnerable to sepsis? So I've mentioned the very young, um, mm -hmm. and particularly children who are preterm and have underlying health conditions are more at risk. Similarly, as we get older, our risk of developing sepsis increases. There's a slight increased risk, and I really don't want to alarm anyone. It's only a slight increased risk in pregnancy. Um, okay. And then people who have impaired immune systems, and that might be from something like HIV, uh, but it might be because of things that health professionals are giving them. It, it might be because they're on steroids or they've received chemotherapy or something like that. And then anything that breaks down the body's normal barriers, particularly things like surgery and trauma, where there's injury to the body, then that can increase the risk of sepsis as well. So we know that sepsis can be difficult to diagnose, but what are the warning signs or the symptoms that our listeners, families, for whether that's adults or for children, that they need to be aware of? What, what are people looking for? So I think you're quite right, Kate. It is important that we talk about adults and children separately. Okay. There are sort of discrete things to look for in those different um, groups. It's partly because children sort of present differently, their physiology is different, but it's also partly because they communicate their symptoms differently to adults. So we do have different symptoms lists. I don't expect, and we don't expect everybody to carry around these symptoms in their heads, but they're available on our website and people can download or order symptoms cards to, to help them just to keep in the drawer somewhere or on the fridge. Again, the most important thing is that you trust your instincts, whether the loved one you're worried about is an adult or a child. If you're worried about them with an infection, and even if they don't have one of these symptoms, then go to 111 online or make an appointment to see the GP and just ask, could it be sepsis? But if you're worried someone is seriously unwell, there are six symptoms to look for. Now in adults, handily, they spell the word sepsis. 
S for slurred speech or confusion. E for extreme pain in the muscles or joints. P for passing no urine, no water in a day. S for severe breathlessness. I for it feels like I'm going to die. And by the way, that is the most commonly reported symptom among survivors. People really do say that. And then the final S for skin that's mottled or discoloured or very pale. Any of those six in an adult in the context of a suspected infection, take them straight to A&E. This is a 999 job. Okay. Okay. In children, the symptoms list is slightly different. So a child might have sepsis if they are breathing very fast, if they've got a fit, if they've had a fit or a convulsion, if they're mottled or look bluish or pale, if they feel abnormally cold to the touch. And obviously by abnormally, we mean obviously if it's in the middle of winter and it's freezing and they've just been outside, they're going to feel cold to the touch. But if they're more cold than you would expect, that's worrying. Now, every parent knows the tumbler test and, you know, knows that if there's a rash that doesn't fade when you press it under a glass, that's alarming. And that remains true here. But it's also about these other rashes, mottled, bluish or pale skin discoloration. And then finally, in children, if the child's very lethargic or difficult to wake up, again, that's very worrying. Any one of those six symptoms, just as in adults, it's get that child straight to A&D. And if necessary, call 999 to get them there. Ron, thank you. Now, um, we've been doing a lot of work recently at Many First Aid to make sure that when we talk about uh, children and adults with black and brown skin, that we make sure that we're very clear with features. And you, re you, you mentioned about those appearances of mottling and bluish and pale. Is that different at all if you have a patient that is, uh, has black and brown skin or is that still the same descriptors? Is there any difference? Yeah, so it can be more difficult, particularly in people with very highly pigmented skin. It can be more difficult to to see these rashes, these discolorations. But, you know, obviously people with darker pigmented skin know this, but, you know, people have lighter patches, paler patches, particularly on the underside of their arms, the, the palms of their hands and, and, and so forth. So it's look in those less pigmented areas for these rashes and discolorations. But it's not just the, the, the sight of them. Some of these rashes can actually feel bumpy as well and feel sort of sometimes a bit like sandpaper under the fingers. So it's important to feel the skin as well, even if it's more heavily pigmented. Okay, so you said about if you suspect sepsis, you have those features, those sit, that checklist of six that you should go to A&E. Is it always straight to A&E or is there GP or anyone else or is it just a straight to A&E with sepsis symptoms? So sepsis is a medical emergency. Okay. And whilst some GPs do carry antibiotics, their, their antibiotics usually designed to help people with meningitis and and in sepsis of other causes those antibiotics might not help so it's critically important that if somebody has one of those six symptoms you just go straight to a and e now we know at the time of recording that sometimes ambulances <coughs> are struggling to respond quickly to calls and if the ambulance service does advise there's going to be a long delay you have to think can i safely get this person to hospital myself because it is that urgent. For every hour we delay in getting the right treatment into the patient, the chance of them surviving drops by one or two percent. We talk a lot with parents and families at our classes where particularly when there's been very heavily documented pressures on the NHS, that there might be a parent or a family member thinking, I just don't want to bother or I just don't want to, I, I don't want to be a burden or I don't want to turn up and be turned away for being paranoid or perhaps, you know, excessively worrying when I shouldn't. Should people worry about that? So if your instincts are telling you, if those alarm bells are ringing, I've never seen my loved one this unwell before, then your actions, to be blunt, can make the difference between that okay. loved one being here tomorrow and not being here tomorrow. So particularly when it concerns children. Look, I, I'm an intensive care doctor, as we've said. So I work in one of my hospitals is a district general hospital. And in those hospitals, the adult intensive care doctor always gets called to help resuscitate a sick child. So we see these children being brought in. And I would much rather, honestly, I'd much rather go down to... 99 kids who don't need my attention and just say hello and walk away again than miss the sure. one who was seriously ill. So if you are worried, don't be afraid of being a nuisance. We would, again, rather see um, 
several well children than miss one critically unwell one. Thank you. Now, how um, if you are in hospital and uh, it is um, it's, you're presenting with symptoms of sepsis, how is uh, sepsis diagnosed and then how is it treated? So the diagnosis is is really tricky, even for very experienced health professionals, because it's a condition that can affect people of any age. It's a condition that arises as a consequence of any infection. So there's not one blood test we can take and and there's not one sign that we look for. So it's what we call a clinical diagnosis. We build a picture. So we're looking for signs. So that will be things like the vital signs, the blood pressure, the breathing rate, the heart rate and so forth. We will include blood tests, we'll do x-rays, maybe CT scans and ultrasounds to look for where the infection is, and very rapidly we try to build a picture. To get this right demands a partnership. It's a partnership between an aware public who know when and how to get their loved one to healthcare with an infection and perhaps ask that question, could it be sepsis, and health professionals who think sepsis, because it's not as simple as just taking a blood test. In terms of the treatment, there's a package of care that we developed at the UK Sepsis Trust called the Sepsis 6. Now, unsurprisingly, that's six simple things that pretty much any health professional can do to help to save that person's life. And it includes, firstly, phoning a more experienced person, phoning the most experienced person, the consultant, um, and getting them there as soon as they're available. It includes sending a full set of blood tests. It includes giving antibiotics, it includes fluid resuscitation into the veins um, and and monitoring the patient as, as, as well. So getting that package of care right has been shown to reduce the risk of a person dying by as much as 50%. So it's hugely effective, it's quite easy to deliver and it's empowering of junior health professionals and that's why we're hugely proud that the sepsis 6 is now totally standard across the UK and it's in use in 36 other countries around the world, which is really humbling. That's incredible. That is absolutely incredible. Now, when you've had a diagnosis of sepsis, are there complications potentially following a sepsis infection? Yes, there are. And, and these are better understood among adults than they are in children. But it would be naive to think that children won't have similar after effects. And it's better understood in adults because more adults develop sepsis than children, thankfully. So we know that about 40% of people who survive sepsis, and I'm talking about adults at the moment, 40% of people who survive sepsis still have life-changing problems at one year after their illness. Now, these can be relatively minor. They can be, um, for example, short-term memory loss or not being able to do quite as much exercise as previously, but equally they can be severe and disabling. And that can range from the very visible, people can lose digits and limbs as a consequence of sepsis, through to the invisible, including PTSD. So sepsis does change people's lives, There was a a nice study in Scandinavia that looked at adults of working age and it found that only just over half of them were back at work one year after their illness. And that's why the Sepsis Trust has support nurses that are on the end of a phone or on the end of an email and they run support groups for people affected just to help them to understand and support them in their recovery journey. Is there, um, can people get sepsis more than once? Is that just terribly unlucky or is it that you may potentially be more susceptible once you've had sepsis yeah so so there's a couple of things to unpick here we talked about people who are at risk of sepsis and i talked about as one example people who have suppressed immune systems so people are on chemotherapy and steroids and that sort of thing but there's other conditions that can do this as well like diabetes and people with chronic chest disease so all of those conditions make people more likely to develop infection and therefore they're more at risk of getting sepsis more than once but even if you remove all of those risk factors and again a bit like the pregnant people I don't want someone who's had sepsis once to live in constant fear of it happening again, but they are slightly more at increased risk afterwards of it happening again, even if they don't have an underlying condition. And it's thought to be just that sepsis causes changes in the immune system, which makes it more prone to overreacting to subsequent infections. But again, to reinforce, it's only a slightly increased risk. Ron, thank you. And I guess having the facts knowing what sepsis is and uh, knowing the, the the six, the symptoms that you need to look for and asking the question, could it be sepsis, 
is all um is, is hugely reassuring for our listeners but there is this thing for me as a parent that just says is it possible to get to a point where we won't have to be frightened of sepsis anymore as a as a population is it something that we'll get to a point where we say we're not frightened of it anymore because we're addressing it, we're facing it? I don't know. I'm just, you know, as a, as a parent, it still is my worst fear, even though I have the facts. Yeah, of course. And, and I think it, we could spend half an hour discussing this. this it, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating area. Um, probably the top level thing to say is we can't stop sepsis. You know, we, okay. we can't stop people developing infections. And in some people, it will trigger sepsis. What we can do is to make more people aware of it, as we're doing now, um, and to make sure that those people get themselves to hospital at the right time and ask the right questions. Now, that will help to reduce the severity of sepsis it will help more people to survive and it will probably improve the quality of life of people who do survive because they won't become as ill to start with so getting this systems right through awareness through health professional awareness and training and getting the right antibiotics into the patient at the right time as one simple example of the therapies we use will help to change outcomes but really to come back to the question i think what we can do is to move toward what we call precision medicine. Like we have if somebody develops breast cancer, we measure the genes and we target the therapy according to the genetic makeup of the patient, among other things. Now, I think there will be a move toward that precision medicine in sepsis. I think it will happen over the next couple of decades. We're not ready for it now. But again, that will help us to improve outcomes. And of course, It'd be wrong of us to, to not remember the enemy in the room, which is antibiotic resistance or antimicrobial resistance, because that could make sepsis harder to treat in the future. And I would just like to say AMR isn't some perceived future threat. It's here today, but it's the rate at which it's growing that we're slightly concerned about. So in summary, the answer to your question we can't stop sepsis. We can get better at treating it. We can work better in partnership with families of loved ones who are deteriorating with infection to get the treatment in quicker. We're going to move towards precision medicine over the next couple of decades, but we're a bit anxious about antibiotic resistance and we do need to address that. Okay, thank you. Now, um, I obviously mentioned when I first introduced you at the, the front end of today's uh, podcast, we talked about your work uh, with Sepsis Trust. Um, and you said that um, you saw a family, a, pet, a family, a patient who, who tragically died from sepsis. And that sort of was the start of your journey. Tell me what the aspiration is or what are the goals for Sepsis Trust? What do you want to achieve with Sepsis Trust? Well, before I do that, I, I really just want to pay tribute to that man, Jem Abbotts, and, you know, his, his widow, Karen, and their children, Tom and Emily. Um, I saw them only a few weeks ago, Karen and Tom and Emily, and, you know, they're a wonderful family and there is a happy outcome. You know, years later, the children are grown up with their own careers and um, Karen's now remarried and they're all very happy. So, um, so Jem has a legacy, which is great. But what do we want to achieve? We work in the spaces of public awareness, health professional education, and we work in supporting people affected by sepsis. And I think if I describe it in each of those three domains, that will really encapsulate what we want to do. I'm going to start with support. At the moment, we have nurses, we have email support, written materials, we have peer support groups. But what we really want to do is to take those resources up a gear, move them into the digital space, provide app-based um, resources to help rehabilitate people from this and, and really help them in their recovery journey, make them motivated in their recovery journey, give them a tracking device and a diary and, and, and help them to really understand. And in turn, we can collect data from there and start to understand what good recovery looks like, obviously with permission. In the awareness space, Obviously, we want sepsis to be as known about as checking your breast for breast cancer, as okay, known sure. about as stroke, as known about as, you know, Vinnie Jones pumping the chest in someone in cardiac arrest, for example. So we need this to become 
a household term. Not that people live in constant fear of it, but that they know about it just in case someone's deteriorating with an infection. And particularly for families with young children, we want to do the same thing. We want to take this into the digital space. We've been working with an academic group called Our Sniff to develop some evidence-based resources to help parents spot sepsis and serious illness in their children. And we want to take that into the digital space into the palm of a parent's hand so that they know where to access the right information if they're worried. And then in the health professional education space, it's all about this precision medicine. At the moment, we have a one size fits all approach to recognizing and treating sepsis. And that's illogical. You know, an 18 year old athlete is going to present very differently to an 88 year old who's got heart disease, for example. Mm -hmm. So we need to develop and work with partners. This won't be the UK Sepsis Trust as a sole stakeholder. We need to work with partners to build better data, better intelligence around what sepsis looks like in different patient groups so that we can start to move toward precision medicine. So there's some exciting things to come, right? And I love the fact that with Midi First Aid, I know we're doing a small, you know, a small piece in this in this campaign. But at our Midi First Aid classes, we cover sepsis in both adults and children and talk about it and give information because there's just this piece that people need to know. They want to know the facts and they need it in an easy to understand, digestible way, don't they? So that we take that fear factor away. So from our conversations today, what would you want families listening to remember most or take away most from what we've been talking about? So before I answer that, Kate, with your permission, I'm yeah. just going to tell anyone listening, because people are, of course, involved with mini first aid if they're listening to this or, or viewing this. But also they might be involved in other things. They might belong to community groups. They might run their own business or, or have access to people who run the business they work in. We have a free set of resources called Sepsis Savvy that organizations can use. Um, they're available for download on our website. It doesn't cost a bean. It just costs your email address and then we ping them over to you. So have a look for that if you're interested. But what's the one take home thing? I think it has to be if someone you love is getting worse with an infection, trust your instinct. If you're worried, go to 111 or see your GP and just ask, could it be sepsis? If you're really worried that this person's seriously ill, go to our website, look for those symptoms. And if they signpost you to A&E, get that person straight to A&E. Ron, thank you. It has been so insightful. And Ron and I have been on video calls several times now. Ron and his team have spoken at our conference and I still learn a new thing every time. So thank you so much. And thank you to everybody that's listening today. Uh, please do keep on following our social channels and keep with us uh, for newsletters to hear more of our latest updates uh, from both uh, the arena of sepsis from Sepsis Trust and also our other healthcare professionals. If you want to see the video of Ron and I talking to Today. You can visit our YouTube channel, uh, Family Health by Mini First Aid, and you can listen to all our podcasts on, our, on your usual podcast channels. Also, if there is a subject that you would like me to talk to a healthcare professional or an expert in field about in family health, please do get in touch because we want to make sure that our family health podcast brings you the information that you want to know about for you and your family. So Ron, on behalf of me and the rest of the Mini First Day team, thank you so much for joining us today and thank you to everybody for listening. And thank you so much for making more people aware. This is so important. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Family Health by Mini First Aid. I hope you found our podcast really useful and informative. If you want to know more about Mini First Aid classes, courses, qualification courses or first aid supplies, please do visit minifirstaid.co.uk or look us up on all your favourite social platforms at Mini First Aid. I take Savlon Scar Prevention Gel everywhere with me so that I'm always prepared for the many little and sometimes bigger accidents that my kids encounter. Thank you again to Savlon Prevention Gel for sponsoring Series 1 of the Family Health by Mini First Aid podcast.